Welcome to The Pilates Show, where we explore creative and innovative Pilates tips and techniques to help to deepen the skill level of the movement educator while having fun. I'm your host, Jennifer Gianni, and today we'll be talking about authenticity. Welcome to my second installment of The Happy Teacher. We have to remember that authenticity in our personal lives and in our teaching is not just a state of being. It's not like we're gonna to get to that point and all of a sudden, we're always gonna be authentic. No, it doesn't work that way, unfortunately. It has to be a practice. It has to be something that we set as an intention for ourselves every day. We have to have that intention that we will be authentic. And you know, one of our greatest powers, and we have to keep remembering this, and this will help us, one of our greatest powers is that I am me and you are you. <laughs> and no one else in the world can do what we do in the way that we do it. So that is our real power. And that should give us inspiration every day. So there are some basic truths that we all need to follow when we set the intention of being authentic. The first one is that we try to have the goal of being real instead of the goal of just being light. So when a client comes into the studio and we start teaching, our goal and our focus should be that we do with the best of our ability what is right for that client in front of us and that we stay on track and that we don't inject the session with personal questions and that we don't just talk about ourselves even if it's professionally and that we don't take away from the client's time or that we're just on autopilot and that we do the same exercises and the same choreography that we've done with the other three clients before this client just because we want to get through with the session. No, none of that is what the client wants, especially long term. What the client wants is that we help guide them. We don't fix them. We help guide them into creating changes and new habits in their body. Number two is to be honorable. And to be honorable, we have to say what we mean and we have to keep our commitments. And that means to ourselves and to our clients and to our family and our friends. So that our word is gold. And we have to think before we speak and we have to really make sure that what we say is filled with honor and intent. Don't be afraid of saying, I don't know. Don't be afraid of saying, I would need more information. Don't be afraid of saying, your health is your responsibility. And I'm here to guide you, but it's gonna take lots and lots of work and all of the hard work is on you. So the client has to be responsible and it's our job to let the client know that they're in for a lot of hard work when they take on the job of changing their body. And you as the instructor have to know and have to realize that you really are not expected to know everything. That's not the game here. And you're not expected to be 100% responsible for the change in the client. You're there as a mentor. You're there as a guide. The fourth one and the last one is to know when to say N-O, no. <laughs> and that's sometimes really hard for us as teachers to say no and to set boundaries. And for the movement instructor, it's really, really important to be on the lookout for physical, spiritual, and emo emotional burnout. One of the ways that we have to be very structured and strict with ourselves 
is in our schedule. We have to make sure that we don't take on too much and that we leave time to refuel. And ultimately, that is going to be the best thing for the client because we're not able to really fully be there as a guide and a mentor unless we're able to recharge ourselves. The first chakra work is physical world work. It orients us to time and space and to our five senses. So the easiest way to start to work on positive first chakra energy and to encourage a sense of authenticity and a sense of honor is to simply work on our standing posture. So I'd like you to try and experiment with your clients and with yourself. Have your clients stand in the easiest, most normal standing posture that they can find and ask them to start to breathe and to notice where the breath is sent. And to also ask them, are they able to feel any sensations around their center, especially at the top of their pelvis and at their lumbar spine? Now, for most clients, especially those beginner clients who are really not used to thinking about their body or moving, what they might sense is that their breath is quite shallow and they might sense, and this is typical, that the breath is sent up into their chest and even into their shoulders and upper back. And for that beginning client, the cue of what do they feel around their center or do they feel some sensation or a gentle hugging, that won't make any sense. Not even to their analytical brain, much less their, their sense of their physicality or sensation. Now to change that and to try to give them sort of the, an opposite experience, ask them to stand in a parallel foot and leg position. And from their ankles, just have them shift forward a bit. You can give them the cue of imagining that they have a surfboard strapped on their back and they're gently leaning into the wind. Now, that, which seems quite simple to us, will be quite hard for a beginning client. So a way to help them find that is to get a stability ball. You can push it under the Cadillac or the Reformer and have their shins just lightly touch the stability ball. And then again, ask them from the shift in their ankle. So they'll be increasing their dorsiflexion just a bit so they'll go forward and they'll feel weight in the balls of their feet and also a little bit of weight in the center of their heel. They can check themselves making sure that their breastbone is right over their pubic bone. And again, they have that sense that they have a surfboard strapped on their back and they're just lightly leaning into the wind. Again, ask them to breathe. With this posture, because they've brought the femur heads right over the center of their talus, right over their pedal base, what's happened is that they've aligned their diaphragms, especially their respiratory diaphragm and their pelvic floor diaphragm. And because of this, they're going to have a much easier, fuller glide of the diaphragm. So with this position, they might start to sense that they're opened in the back body. That when they breathe, they feel more opening in their backside ribs. And especially on the exhale, they start to feel that sensation and that gentle hugging around the top of their pelvis and lumbar spine. So what they're starting to feel is that gentle hugging their core muscles starting to hold them from within. Also, with this posture, it opens us up to sensing more. Our perceptions are fuller and wider, and we stand taller. 
we're right on the center of our spine and we're able to reach through the crown of our head. In opposition to how most of us stand daily, which is a little bit back with lots of weight in the heel, it drags the back of our rib cage down and it keeps us from really having a full glide of the diaphragm. And for most of us during the day, we're not on the center of our spine, reaching with the crown of our head up. We're either a little bit slumped back, and at times, because we want to see something or hear something or look at the computer pretty intently, we're forward. And either of these two extremes, either back or too forward, we're shortening our spine. And so to really get the client to embody the, their center and how they reach through their center, the best way to do it, the simplest way to do it, is here with their shins at the stability ball. Creasing in the front of their ankle, weight on the balls of the feet in the center of the heel, where their respiratory diaphragm and pelvic diaphragm can align. Ginger wrote in and asked about a new client uh, who sits a lot, who's overweight, who started at the Y and didn't do so well with the strength training. Uh, Ginger also says later in her question that this client, it's very, very hard for this client to be in a prone position, almost impossible. And so Ginger wants some advice on how she can affect and create the kind of work that we might get in a prone position without actually getting on the floor and lying on the belly. <laughs> so I've come up with some creative solutions at the wall and then a walking exercise for this client. So let's look at the one at the wall first. So this again would be for that client who's just not comfortable getting in a prone position on their belly. So you could have a yoga block at the wall, and this is a full body exercise. So this, you know, it'll take them some repetition and detailed cueing to really get their alignment right here. Um, and it's hard work, but I think that it w might be a good fit for Ginger's client. So the forehead is gonna go onto the yoga block. And if this is too much detail for the client at first, you can leave this part out and just say, press your forehead into the yoga block. What I enjoy doing is putting my forehead at the bottom edge of the yoga block and allowing the yoga block to drag the skin of my forehead down to my nose. Because what that creates, even that little bit of dragging the skin down to my nose, that creates an opposition of the crown of my head up towards the ceiling, which is really nice. But again, for the beginner client, that could be a little bit too much detail. You might wanna save that for later. But I'm gonna go ahead and do it, putting my skin of my forehead towards my nose. I'm standing on all four corners of my feet. Now, I wanna feel my belly lift and my tail drop. So I get this sensation of openness in the front of my hips. And then here, I can start to extend my arms back to open my chest a little bit. But I wanna be sure that the client's strategy is not getting their arms back by shoving the ribs forward. So I want them to keep the fullness of their pelvis and their spine and then see how far can they move the arms back, really staying responsible for that fullness. And then we can also explore bringing the arms to the side, pelvis and spine stay the same, and then even bringing the arms up, coming into shoulder flexion, and again, the spine and pelvis stay the same. And so they can go through all of these three positions and transitioning through them eventually in a nice, fluid way. Now, another element of a prone position is to teach hip extension. It's really nice for clients to have them on their belly, 
They can feel the feedback of the floor on their shoulders and their hips and explore that just right amount of um, bringing the leg back to create hip extension. Again, without having to shove my spine forward to get my leg back, right? So another nice thing that you can do with the client, client who's not able to get on their belly, also a client who has a neck and lower back chronic pain, um, is to have them walk backwards. Because an element of walking backwards is immediately turning on your hip extensors. Let's look at it. So you, as the teacher, could be guiding the client. Right? So you're, you're making sure, of course, they're not going to run into anything. And you could have your hands there to help support them if balance was an issue. And for a lot of your non-movers, walking backwards is something that they never do. <laughs> so be sure that you're there to catch them if they fall. So from here, your client can move backwards. Now, you want to make sure that they're reaching into their first ray. Clients who have bunions, this is going to be such a hard challenge for them, but it's something that they should practice. All right, so you're automatically turning on your hip extensors here, opening the front of the hip, and really paying attention to rolling through your feet. It seems super simple, but this can be a game changer for a lot of people. Now, if you want to add on to this, so you want to give them a little bit of an extra challenge, you can put a, a dowel into their hands and have them hold it like they're holding up a tray and have them think about just a little bit of an extension in their upper back. So they're kind of looking towards the corner of the ceiling in front of them. Now from here, they do the same thing, walking backwards keeping this little lift in the upper back as they go backwards. And again, you can be close by as the teacher <laughs> just to keep an eye that they're not going to lose their balance. And they can go as slow as they need to go. That's it for today. If you have an observation or a question that you'd like to see answered in an upcoming episode, comment below on Facebook, Twitter, or the forum on our site. See you next time and never stop learning. Or the forum on our site. See you next time and never stop learning. Uh. <laughs>